Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, I always welcome any opportunity I can to stand in front of people and uh, help them with their usually taxes. Uh, but I also uh, especially like talking to them about investments because I find that uh, I like real estate um, and I just find that a lot of people aren't getting the uh, information and education that they want for real estate related investments. So, Again, I uh, thank you, David, for the opportunity to talk about some real estate-related investments. So, uh, my company is Canadian Investment Services. Uh, this, my logo, when I say CIS equals EIS, what that means is CIS is Canadian Investment Service. EIS is Education, Information, and then Solution or Selection. And I always try to educate people First, give them the information they need. Educate them about the investment market uh, place. Uh, I want the my client to lead me to the investment product that they want to be invested in, which is a lot different than the invest how the investment industry works. Uh, so, uh, you know, I kind of take pride that most of the clients that I have are invested in investment products that they want to be invested in, not something I'm selling them, just things that they want to be invested in like real estate. So we're going to talk about a few different things tonight. We're going to talk about uh, real estate related investment opportunities. There's all kinds of things going on out there. So we're going to talk about different things, uh, all real estate related. We're going to talk about uh, how you invest in these type of investments. Uh, we are going to talk, um, we are also going to talk about how real estate related investments can help uh, people's business models if they want. Okay, I work with a lot of third parties. My uh, Canadian Investment Service Investment Platform is actually a, a platform that third parties can use. I work with a lot of accountants, I work with a lot of real estate agents, I work with a lot of bookkeepers. Anybody that has a client base, if they want to expand their business model, they can use my business model. I'll explain how it's all set up. We're also going to talk about a specific real estate investment related opportunity, and that's fix and, fix and flips. Okay, so that's something that uh, we do uh, ourselves internally uh, in my company. Uh, again, uh, David introduced, David just stole my thunder here when he introduced these people, but that's okay. That's all right. So we got Sean here, the builder guy, and uh, his lovely wife, Simone, who's uh, the, the real estate agent. So Simone finds us the properties. Uh, I put the money together. I bring in like great joint uh, ventures. So I bring people together. I'll explain that when we talk about that. Um, and Sean builds the houses, and he builds a really nice house. How quick did you build this last one? So we're selling one. Uh, we listed it today, Simone. Yes, we did. And you started when? June 15th? 27th. June 27th, knocked it right down to the ground, took the basement out, put the basement out, built three stories, and we're selling it today. So that's pretty good. Almost two million. How much? Well, we listed it for 195. Yeah, so it's a $2 million, hopefully we get over it. You know, we try to get those bidding bidding wars that uh, everybody uh, likes to do. We're on the good side of the fence with bidding war, not the other side of the fence where we have to pay all this money. So. Anyway, those types of picks and puts, we'll talk about them in a bit. Um, I'm gonna talk about the investment industry. Okay, I have a very, uh, I, I think it's important that people better understand the investment industry. Um, and I think that because uh, it just gives you a better handle on making investment decisions. It's like anything. If you understand the foundation, uh, then when information is put on top of the foundation, uh, you have a better grasp of it. So the investment industry, I have a very unique background. Um, as David said, I started, uh, I'm actually a tax guy. I worked with um, like Touche, one of Canada's largest uh, charter county firms. I spent nine years there, worked in their small business and tax department, so a very strong tax uh, background. Uh, and then uh, I took my accounting designation and I went right into the regulated and licensed investment marketplace. And that was in 1995. And 20 years later, I took my accounting designation and I left the investment marketplace because I didn't like what was going on in there. I left the licensed and regulated investment marketplace because I became a real estate investor and I just couldn't do what I wanted to do in the licensed and regulated investment marketplace. So uh, I'll get into that in a bit when we start talking about it. So the, uh, let's talk about the investment marketplace a bit. Again, <coughs> I call it the regulated and licensed. 
So in Canada, we regulate by province. So we don't have a Canadian investment regulator. We regulate by province. And that was a good time. We all have a handout. So if you can grab this book, you can follow along with me. It was a pamphlet. If you open the pamphlet, turn to page one to this thing. This is just a quick, I'm just going to go quickly through this and I'll uh, explain how the investment marketplace works. Yeah, yeah. Do a whole bunch. Thank you. All right, I brought my, uh, I love prompts, so here we go. So there is, this is the regulated investment marketplace. Okay, I spent a lot of money on these prompts. <laughs> so pay attention. And inside the, the, the regulated marketplace, you're going to see five circles. Okay. Hey, Doug. Okay, these circles. Here's my props. Okay. Follow me through here. There is meaning here. Okay, so inside of the investment regulated marketplace, we have se five separate regulated. We have stocks and bonds. Okay, we have mutual funds. We have private equity. We have mortgages. And we have insurance. Okay, now those are five separate regulated marketplaces. And uh, all investment advisors that are licensed are licensed within one of those marketplaces. Okay, and those marketplaces work independently. They do not work together. So I'm somebody, I went into this investment marketplaces, and I have been work, I've worked in, I've been licensed in, been regulated by each of those five marketplaces over the 20 years that I worked within that marketplace. So I have uh, some credibility to talk about these marketplaces. Uh, and the one problem was, again, I was a real estate investor, and I couldn't find real estate investments, okay? Uh, Stocks and bonds, I mean, yes, you can buy real estate stocks. I kind of wanted a more hands-on approach. Uh, mutual funds, sure, there's real estate mutual funds, but that really didn't do it for me. <clears throat> Private equity, now there's a uh, marketplace that you actually can get some real estate investments, so I do like that marketplace as far as real estate income trust, I'll explain that in a little, little bit later. Uh, so these three marketplaces, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and private equity, as you can see by the chart, is regulated in the province of Ontario by the Ontario Securities Commission. And we find a lot of financial products in there. <coughs> so, and then the mortgage and insurance is governed by Fiscal Financial Service Commission of Ontario. We don't find a lot of financial products in those, in the mortgage insurance. We're basically going to that industry to get mortgages and to get insurance. So that's kind of how the regulated marketplace work works. And somehow by bouncing around with these marketplaces, I became the only person in Canada that's a chartered professional accountant that has worked and been regulated in all five of those industries. So uh, I did that again, not to try to be that person. I kept jumping around because I wanted to find real estate investments. Again, these, these industries work independent of each other. And one of the problems is people Licensed advisors work within their, I call them silos. So if you are working with, you know, I'll use an investor's group, they're mutual fund licensed, okay? You're just gonna get mutual funds. You're not gonna get a lot of the real estate investments that we talked about. So I left the uh, licensed regulated investment industry in 2015 because I wanted to create a credit company where I could really build some real estate investments. And so that's exactly what I did. So the, the, the real estate investments that we talk about, let me describe some of them. There's lots of different ones. So if you open my, both my pamphlet to, the, to that page, Okay, I start describing a lot of what I call the non-regulated investment marketplace. These are things that I can do without an investment license. Okay, I can, I can do private real estate joint ventures, which is what I do with our fix and flips. Uh, I can help people hold mortgages in their RSP. 
Okay, a lot of people don't know they can hold mortgages in an RSD. Okay, uh, they can. And it's a very good investment. Uh, an RSP is not an investment. It is a bag that you hold investments in. Okay, so inside of that RSP bag, you can have different investments. You can have mutual funds, you can have stocks. But you can also cash those out and hold the mortgage in there. Okay, we'll talk a little more, more about that. Uh, I have people own their own rental properties. Uh, sometimes people just want to own their own rental properties and they, and they need help. Uh, we, can, we, we can do that. Uh, investing in your own business. That's sometimes not a bad place for people's investment money. Uh, private mortgage lending, we do a lot of that. Uh, people perceive the private mortgage lending business to be very risky. Uh, it depends what we're investing in. So to me, private mortgage lending can uh, be not risky, uh, as you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Private limited partnerships, okay, uh, we do those, okay, they're, they're uh, popular in the world of real estate income trust, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, real estate fix and flips, so we're going to focus on that and shortly, and uh, we'll talk about the ones that we've done, the ones that we're doing, we'll go into a little more detail, how I structure them, how I involve uh, investors. Uh, and then Child Home Ownership Program, that was, uh, if anybody's interested in that, I have some brochures. Uh, that was kind of something I created, and uh, I'll explain how that came about. So what this program is about is using money in registered plans, RSP, or LEAR, Locked In Retirement Accounts, and we use that money to buy a rental property outside of the registered plan. And it all kind of I put it all together after I met with this client, the lady was like 70, 71, and she had like $350,000 in her RSP, so she had to convert it. Some of you may know that's 71, you have to convert that money into a RIP. So I was meeting with her, and it was a new client, and you know, basically went through the typical, you know, what do you want to do with your money, blah, blah, blah. And she, was, uh, she had a lot of other money, so she, for lack of a better word, she didn't need that money. But she says, I have to take, uh, at 71, you have to take a minimum amount out. We went through some estate planning stuff, and uh, I said, you know, what's the intent of your money? She goes, well, I'm just going to sit there, and my kids will get it. My kids, she had one daughter. And I said, okay, that's good. So she was 70, and uh, you know, I said, well, when do you expect to die? <laughs> she goes, well, hopefully not for 25, 30 years. <laughs> I said, all right, so now we got to do something with the money for 25 to 30 years. We shouldn't just let it sit there. So then we shared the discussion about how, um, how hard it is for kids these days to buy a house. We all know. I have two boys. My God, thank God I can help them because if I couldn't, they'd never own a house. So I'm sure many of you are in the same spot. So it's hard for these kids to buy houses. And we were sharing that uh, con con conversation. And then this lady says, well... She had a daughter and she had a newborn grandchild. And she said, well, my granddaughter probably will never be able to buy a house. And I'm like, well, why don't we help her? And she said, well, how do we do that? So I suggested that she use the money inside of her RSP to buy a rental property outside of the RSP and that that rental property could just be rented out. And I explained all the benefits, as we all know about real estate investing. We buy a property, it goes up in value, the mortgage goes down, we build up equity. So I explained all that to her. She liked that idea, <clears throat> and you know, for a 71 year old lady, she wasn't too interested in buying a rental property, but I said, have your daughter manage it, have a third party manage it, it doesn't have to be a burden. Um, anyway, long story short, we went through that whole process, uh, and we did it, and uh, we bought the house, and uh, so the put a tenant in there, and I said, when your granddaughter is 20 or 25, that mortgage will be gone. Um, and you can change title anytime. You don't have to wait 20, 25 years. You can use, you can buy the house outside of the RSP and sell it anytime. Uh, and then, the, and then, then, then she made a comment that her, what if her daughter doesn't have the money to buy the RSP? And I said, well, you can hold back a mortgage, lend her take back, right? Let's say the house is worth whatever, 400,000, 500,000. You can sell it to her for fair market value. You can give it to her. You can sell it to her for somewhere between zero and fair market value and you can hold back the uh, mortgage. And we literally, that would be creating a cash flow out of thin air. So really, instead of paying the bank, 
paying, you know, the child is paying the grandparents. So the thing worked great. So I just modeled it all up, put a structure around it, uh, and I called it Child Home Ownership Program. So it's pretty cool, I think, for people who want to help their kids, uh, you know, get a house if you have money in the RSP. Uh, it's a good way, it's a good vehicle to uh, do that. So we, those are things we do outside. Again, those things I've mentioned are all outside of the regulated marketplace. So you can't do all that stuff inside. So if you're working with an advisor inside the regulated marketplace, you can't do all that stuff. You can't do fix and fix, fix and put you can't, you can't do these child home ownership pro, pro, programs. So uh, I find it a, a good benefit to be outside of the marketplace. Just keep going here. So other things we, uh, real estate related investments, uh, mix, mortgage investment corps. Uh, those are funds that basically have money in them and they invest them in mortgages. And they average reasonable rates of return, seven, eight percent. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, now there's, you know, the risk with those is that they're invested in many different mortgages. You could look at that as a risk or you could look at that as a, as a non-risk. But there's diversification. Uh, again, on the private mortgage line, I do a lot of it. And uh, when we talk about real estate, real estate is a very broad term. You know, when someone says, oh, I like investing in real estate, okay, we really need to drill down what that means, okay? Uh, so, for example, real estate, wow, I mean, is it uh, domestic, is it Canadian, is it foreign, is it uh, high end, is it low end, is it residential, is it commercial? Uh, so there's many variations of real estate investing. Personally, I like the residential. Uh, I like the low to medium market. Okay, I try not to play in the high end market. Um, and when we talk about the low to medium, I like the uh, two hours outside of Toronto. So if we drew a line from London, Waterloo, Owen Sound, or really to Peterborough, outside of that Toronto market, there's a lot of opportunities there, especially for multi-unit. Okay, uh, multi-unit just scales, just economies of scale to your, uh, to your, uh, to your real, real estate investment. So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, real estate income trusts. Okay, we can find real estate income trusts in the private equity world. Okay, so I use uh, a lot of different real estate income trusts. The ones I like the best, I don't know if anybody's heard of Centurion REIT, okay. That's a big, that's a, they've got 140 apartment buildings in there, most of which are uh, in the GTA, the two hours outside of the GTA. And these are apartment buildings, they're nothing fancy. They're big, 100, 100 units. Uh, like any apartment building REIT, the concept is very simple. They collect the rent, they take their management fee, and they, and they have net to rent. And they, a company like Centurion will disperse all that net, net rent to the uh, investors. For 35 years, Centurion REIT has paid back eight, nine percent to their investors quarterly. Okay, that's a pretty good track record. And then when you look at the risk, okay, you look at all these apartment buildings, you realize where they're located outside of two hours outside of Toronto. The vacancy rates have been next to nothing. They probably will remain next to nothing. These rents are, you know, in the say twelve hundred to two thousand monthly rent. Everybody needs a house. Everybody needs a place to live. People can't afford to buy houses, so the rental market, in all probability, will remain very strong. Uh, we continue to bring three through fifty, four hundred thousand new Canadians into Canada every year. Most of them land in the GTA. Not all of them can afford houses. They need apartments. So to focus the uh, real estate investing in that marketplace, to me, makes a lot of sense, okay? Uh, and, but, you know, people say, what about this pending crash that's coming that we've talked about for 20 years now, okay? Well, yeah, you gotta take that into account. Uh, but what happens if something does happen to the real estate market? Okay, well, the high end is gonna get beat up that. Okay, so you don't really, you know, that's, add a little bit of risk when you're playing in that market. Why I like the low to medium market is because, for those of you that understand cap, cap rate, the low end of the market is protected by a cap rate. Okay, so what I mean by that, 
So I'll use my own example. I have two townhouse con rental, just uh, townhouse condos in Orangeville, okay, an hour north of the city. Uh, so they're worth today probably three fifty, four hundred thousand bucks. They're nothing fancy. Uh, they're certainly they're on the lower end of the market, but they're not the low end of the market. But I look at them, and you know, I get about two thousand dollars a month rent. Okay, and if there's something happens to the market, the rents don't go down. Okay, the rents haven't gone rents haven't gone down for what thirty five years. The rents just do not go down. I'm not saying they didn't, but you know, we have to use some past data to make some financial decisions. So I look at that and I'm going, okay, so what happens if something happens to the market? So those houses, those condos, the cap rate, i.e. what I can get for rent, will protect the value of that property. So even if the market crashes a bit or comes down a bit, my property probably won't go down a lot because the value of that can be tied to the cap rate. Which means the market above it, the median market, can't come down too far. So if the low end market's not gonna come down, the median market can't come down too much. Okay, so uh, for that reason, I find that marketplace extremely strong to build uh, real estate related investment opportunities around. Okay, whether you want to own one of these properties yourself, whether those types of properties are in real estate income trusts, uh, which they are. Uh, again, a lot of these uh, REITs, uh, Poulos Investments is another company we raise a lot of money for. That's a company located in Hamilton. So now they have 12 apartment buildings. They focus on Hamilton. And they buy apartment buildings that, uh, they're not 100 units, they're 20 to 30 units, that's their focus. Uh, and those units need work, okay? They're not in real bad shape, but their rents are, you know, they've had the same tenants forever, they're paying eight or $900. Uh, they buy these apartments, they fix them up, they increase the rents for 15, 16, 1700. Uh, and it's not just pie in the sky talk, they've done it, they're doing it as we speak. Uh, it is happening uh, not only with them, but with many. So a lot of these companies are buying these places, renovating them, and, 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 and increasing the rent, which then on a cap rate basis, as, as most of you know, increases the value of the building. So those are all in real estate income trusts, okay? Uh, probably one of my favorite investments, okay? So I kind of look at real estate, I mean, you picture a house, <clears throat> and you know, you can build strategies around that real estate asset. So you can borrow against it, or sorry, you can lend against it, okay? So that's just holding a mortgage. That's just private mortgage lending. You can lend against that house. You can lend as an individual, okay? Again, just private mortgage lending. You can lend as a group, okay? That's a syndicated mortgage, okay? Now that's been beat up a bit in the news, syndicated mortgages. Uh, in theory, they're fine. Fortress was a company that did a lot of syndicated mortgage and uh, a lot of bad news from that, but that doesn't mean syndicated mortgages in general are bad. It means some of the companies that offer these syndicated mortgages are bad. Uh, so you can lend against a house as a group. Uh, you look at that same house, you can own it as an individual, okay? So uh, that's just owning your own rental property. And you can own that house as a group, which is a real estate income trust. So that's kind of how I look at real estate, and I look at the house, and then we can also build uh, investment strategies around it, such as a fix, a fix and flip, or other different types of strategies. But the key thing is, is that the asset protects the money, okay? One problem I have with the investment industry is they do the, uh, the product goes ahead of the financial planning process. So what I mean by that, I'll pick on an investor group, I guess, because they're easy to pick on. If you go into an investor group office, they're going to sell you mutual funds. Okay, they're going to use that product to do your financial planning with. Okay, where I think that's completely backwards. You should be able to start with the financial planning process. So again, in my company, we start with educating the client, educating them about the marketplace, giving them information. Okay, I ask give them information about the various products 
help them select the type of products they want to be in, then you use those products and apply the financial planning process to get them to where they want to be. So I find that it's completely backwards the way everybody else does it, and I do it a different way, and I find most clients are appreciative, but you know, that's an approach we use. So. Uh, anyway, that's uh, a bunch of the uh, different um, uh, real estate investments. And now how do we buy them? So we're going to talk quickly about how you get involved in these. Most of it is pretty common, com common sense. Um, so real estate joint ventures, that's just basically people pooling their money together for a cause. Okay, and again, we do that, I do that with the real estate fix and flips. We get people together, I'll explain that when we talk more about the fix and flips. Uh, holding mortgages, that again, is just done through a trustee. Every registered plan in Canada has to be administered by a trustee, whether it's a RSP, whether it's a LIRA, locked in retirement account, whether it's a TFSA, whether it's a registered education savings plan, has to be administered by a trustee. Uh, not all, in fact, very few trustees allow you to hold mortgages in your, in your registered plan. Uh, the, the, the laws of the land allow you to do it, it's just most trustees won't do it. Uh, Olympia Trust is one trust company that facilitates this stuff. Uh, Pacific Western will facilitate Community Trust in Mississauga, that's another trustee that will help you hold mortgages in your RSP. So that's just an easy reallocation of your of your current uh, investments. And in your own rental property, well, that's you know most of us probably have experienced owning a property, uh, whether it's a rental or own. It's just buying buying a house. Um, private mortgage lending, we've talked about, uh, and then the fix and flip. So we'll talk about that a bit. So again, I have my team here, Tom and uh, lovely wife Simone. So how we do this? Uh, so, if you want to just give us a minute of your time and tell us all about yourself. And... Sure. Alright, so my name is Simone. I work with World of Patriot Seed Services. We're at 2320 Bourse Street West. Come on, give me the mic. We can't really hear you. I'm sorry. Take that mic. Take that mic. Stand in front of this. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty then. Hi, everyone. My name is Simone. And my name is Simone Chang. I work with World of Patriot Seed Services. Um, we're at 2320 Bourse Street West. And of course, I work with Jerry and my husband, um, who's the builder. And uh, what would you like me to say? That's it. Your time's up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not mad. You're going to say how well your husband builds a house. Oh, yeah, definitely. He's a great builder. Um, a little biased. A little and biased. a little biased, but we do have a great team of people that we do work with. Um, I, don't, I, don't wanna, I never, ever would like to take credit just on my, myself or just him, but there is a great team of people, guys, who do actually get the stuff going. They're very focused on what they do, and they're, they just work hard. And they work day and night from Monday to Sunday, if we get the permissions from the neighbors to do so. And they do, they do what they do, and they accomplish it. So we have to thank them as well, because without them, we don't have a team, right? All right. Uh, yes. Could I ask uh, both of you, Jerry, uh, sure. both of you, Simone, how is title held on the fix and flips for both uh, investors as a JV and if you do it yourself? Yeah, okay, so uh, thank you, Simone. You're very thank welcome. You very much. Thanks. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question. Uh, why do we do them is, is where I want to start, but then, then I'll get to your, uh, we do them because there's an appetite. Like, that's it. People have asked for them. People that have come from this invested, from the regulated investment industry, just like I did. Where's the real estate investments? Well, they're not in there. Not all these ones I've described. How can I invest in a house? How can I invest in a fix and flip? So there was an appetite uh, for that type of investment. I have the background that I can create these joint ventures and, and put everything together. I met Sean, um, and two things really impressed me about him, uh, I'll be honest. One, sounds funny, doesn't get his hands dirty, okay? And I say that with all due respect, he manages the project, okay? He's not in there getting his hands dirty, so he stands back and he orders everybody around. You do that, you do that, you do that, you do that. And it's very interesting to watch because he can do, we're doing right now, we have three projects on the go. And he can go from three different projects and manage it and uh, he does a great job of doing it. So that's the one thing. The other thing is, uh, he, like me, cares about our investments and that's the, uh, our investors 
immensely. Okay, that's very important to me, okay, because I've come from an industry in the regulated market where you don't see that often. You know, most investment advisors, tons of great ones out there, a lot of them are just selling stuff to their clients. Okay, that drove me nuts. Okay, so I want to actually do something that the client comes first, we care for them, make sure their investment is protected. Uh, and Sean shares that um, uh, trait with uh, me. So our investors feel very well looked after, very well protected. That's important, okay? Uh, plus he builds a great house. So, you know, great uh, qualities, uh, great team. Uh, we've been making investors money. Uh, investors have been very happy with what we've done. So Lee, to answer your question, so how do we take title? So I take title in my limited company. Okay, so I drive the ship. Okay, the buck stops with me. Uh, Sean has money in each project. Okay, I make sure he has money in, just so he can't run away. He has to finish the job. <laughs> can't leave my investors hanging. As nice a guy as he is, I only get caught, uh, you know, with half a house built. And where's Sean? So he has money in projects. So he has to finish the project uh, and get his money out. Uh, so we basically structure it that uh, the investors. It depends how they're invested. So the very first one we did uh, was 100% equity. Okay, where we used all investors' money, and we like to make our investors 20% and more. Uh, so that was costly, it was good and bad. Good that the investors were happy, bad that we gave a lot of money away, but I guess that's good, because that's the job we're in. So uh, future projects, we usually will use uh, institutional money. Uh, so on a typical purchase, I'll use a real simple example. Uh, we buy places around the million dollar mark, bungalows that haven't been touched for many years. We concentrate on Etobicoke. Uh, we will look elsewhere. Uh, so we buy the place for a million bucks. I'll use 750. David will find me 750 institutional. Uh, we need 250 from our investors. Okay. Uh, usually what I do, uh, I don't register that against the property. Okay. Uh, I usually give them a promissory note with the ability to register. So if they feel there's something going wrong, they can run out and register against title, which means I can't sell that property until I satisfy their needs. Because uh, I have to save a spot, so the first mortgage is with the 750 that David find, find, finds me. That closes the property. So if you follow the math, I spent a million bucks, 250 from the investors, 750 from institutional money. Uh, I'll, I'll use 100 grand to close it. Okay, the land transfer tax in Toronto is crazy, it is what it is. You gotta pay it, you gotta pay the mortgage fees. So it's not 100, but let's just use it for simple math. So I need that from the investors. So now I have 350 from the investors. Uh, and then we have to build the thing. So Sean needs four or 500 grand to rebuild this property. Uh, so we get that normally from institution, because institution money is cheaper. Okay, we can get institution money on the purchase, the 750, for 10%, including fees. Uh, and on the construction, we can get it for 14%-ish, uh, including fees. So that's better than paying the investors 20 or 20%. Plus, if we do go that route, the investors' returns are actually am amplified, okay? Because we're not giving 20% to the first or second. So first mortgage is, in my example, 750. Second mortgage will register for 400 uh, for the construction. Uh, I usually have to put in the first 100,000, so construction will, I put in 100, construction will come behind me, give me 100 every time we, we uh, spend 100. So I need about uh, 450, 500 grand of investor money to do a 1.5 cost. Okay, and then hopefully in a perfect world, we sell it for $2 million, hopefully. Uh, so there's a lot of room there to, you know, if we don't sell it for $2 million, Okay, so uh, the one thing I like is when we do this, my investors do not feel their capital is at risk. And that's important to me, because again, I really, my investors are important, so I want to make sure they're looked after. So they don't feel at risk. The question becomes, how much of a return are we going to get? Okay, uh, so that's important. Uh, again, with the investors, we try to get them uh, money based on the length of time that I've used their money. So if I'm trying to get somebody 20%, and the project takes us six months, if I've used $500,000, uh, that's 10% for six months. 
and they usually get more. Okay, so we structure these deals. Sean gets paid basically a labor's wage to build. Uh, we structure these uh, the profit in, in, in increments of hundred thousand dollars. So we use the first increments to make sure the investors get a decent rate of return, and the higher increments. Uh, we make sure that Sean gets paid, he builds a good house and a good time and you know, the market works for us. So Sean and I get paid a little more money if we can sell that, that 1.5 house for $2 million. So that type of scenario, everybody's happy, okay? And if anybody's gonna be un unhappy, it's gonna be me and Sean and not the investors, okay? I don't make a penny on this stuff, not a penny, until the property sells at a profit and the investors are looked after first. Okay, so I don't know if that's a smart business model, but that's the way it is. <laughs> I should probably change that. Dan, how much time do I have left, Dave? Uh, yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, any questions on that fix and flip that we do? Yes. First of all, you mentioned the three previous, right? Sorry? Previous topic. You mentioned about that you use the rescue money and yeah. you give it to her So what she's talking about is what we call a non-arms length mortgage. You can lend the mortgage to yourself. You can do it. There's nothing against the rules that say you can't do it. There's three things that happen when you lend the mortgage to yourself. One, you pay CMHC fees. Two, you have to qualify for the bank, just like you would with any other mortgage. Three, you have to have the proper loan, loan to value. So even though the concept is good, I've talked a lot of people out of it because if you can qualify at the bank, why don't you go get the bank 3% money? Most people that even consider doing that on a, what we call a non arms length basis, which means lending to yourself, do it because they're frustrated with what their RSPs are doing. Okay, my, very common. My money hasn't made me any money. I might as well just pay myself 3% because my money isn't making any money. Well, I always say, well, what if your money was making 8%? Would you still do it? which leads us into a whole other conversation. Okay, so you can do it. I don't know why you're saying you can't do it. You can do it. Uh, the other way to lend money is what we call arms length. So you lend money to a third uh, party. And for lack of better words, it's quite surprising. Uh, there is next to no rules on that. It's your money. You do what you get to do with you want. You want to lend 100% against the house, you can lend 100% loan to, loan to value against that house. There's no CMHC, there's nothing. Okay, I've done over 100 of these, so you know what I'm talking about. So, anyway, yes? You mentioned that you, the specific house that's approximately 2 million in the end. Yeah. The borough 750, then 350, another 100. Yeah. And then you're hoping that some of 2 million that uh, should make more than a minimum, minimum wage. Yeah. What is the security that people who are putting, putting the money in there, your investors? How you secure them in the hope for you giving them? Yeah, so, uh, so how, first of all, most of the investors that I use uh, know me, okay? So the trust has been built up, yeah. okay? So I'm not saying there's not new investors that come in. Uh, so how I protect, again, first spot goes to the bank that gives me 750 on the purchase. Second spot goes to the construction financing money. Uh, then I issue promissory notes, which is an IOU. I owe you the money piece of paper. On that promissory note, I said, you can go and register against that property anytime. I tell you, there's already one, there's already two, but if something goes side, sideways and you don't like how things are going, you're just going to go and register a mortgage against that property, which is going to prevent me from selling it until we deal with whatever issue that, that we have. Nobody has registered a mortgage from a promissory note yet. So, so your typical deal might be, as you just explained, Jerry, where you'd have you know, a million and a half at risk yeah. with an expected return of 500,000. Okay, so the 500,000 is gonna be taxed as income. Correct. Okay, yeah. so you're left with about 250,000. Say three. Uh, yeah. Say three, 
Okay. Yeah. So you're left with three hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, your um, cost to sell is, is marginal, right? It costs nothing to, to to get out of it. So you, you've got a team, right? So it costs you very little. So, you, so you, it's so, a lot of money to sell a house. Well, <laughs> it, it, yes, but let's so that you've got a good relationship, yeah. obviously, right? Okay. And so, uh, looking at the ROI, it might be three hundred thousand net yeah. on possibly uh, five hundred thousand of risk capital. Right. So that might be might be sixty percent. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and it might be a year, it might be six months. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is that an expected return, fifty to six percent, sixty percent of invested capital? Yeah, that's that's pretty high. Okay. So I what mean, would be, the expected. What you, you know, I try to say to the client, look, we're going to try. You know, pretty sure we're going to make you twenty percent. We're going to try to make you thirty percent. Okay. Because again, that five hundred thousand. I mean, again, we have to take real estate costs off. Uh, you know, so they're not getting fifty percent of their money. No. So, so what do you distribute? So, so how do you and, distribute? And, how do you distribute the the, the, the the delta between the cost and the and, and the profit? Well, also remember that I do it as a joint venture. So, those of you that right. don't understand a joint venture, which means I do a financial statement on the house, proceeds of disposition two million dollars, cost one point five, profit five hundred thousand. Where's your share? There's your share. There's your share. There's your share. I give that to you, you got to put that on your tax tax return. So I'm not, a joint venture doesn't pay tax. It allocates the income to the different parties. Okay, so the, the income tax is your responsibility, it is what it is. I mean, hey, you pay money, you got to pay tax. So, yes. Great question, Jerry. Uh, so for joint venture partnerships, what would be the minimum investment? Ah, good question. Okay. So, glad you asked, because I'm sympathetic to people who want to get involved, but don't have the money. And I gotta share a little story, I know David's gonna give me the ax here, so maybe he's gone. He's gone. <laughs> so this, this, our, this thing in the thing, invest in real estate for, for $1, okay, okay. And it caught my eye, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go listen to this seminar. And long story short, we basically, a uh, company out, out west, they were, it was cloud-based, but they literally uh, bought a property, let's just use a million dollars, they created a million shares, and you bought a share for money. So you could literally buy a share for a buck. Yeah. So you're part of that thing. So when I'm creating all my things, I, I'm sympathetic to that person that wants to get involved in that stuff that doesn't have a hundred thousand bucks or two or two hundred grand. Uh, I have no minimums, none, zero. Okay, you want five thousand dollars into our project? Put five thousand dollars into our project. You're not getting a promissory note. You're not getting a, a, an ability to register a mortgage. Okay, if you're going to give me five thousand bucks, I'll take it. You're part of our investor group. You're not going to have any say. <laughs> You're going to watch the project. We'll give you all the financial information we re 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 report. But you can't hold this up. You can't go and register a mortgage for $5,000 investment. So I have no minimums, and I do it not because I need the money. I do it because I'm sympathetic with people who you know, just don't have the money or want to dip their toe in the water. Hey, let's try this, and uh, let's not, you know, who is this guy? Let, 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 let's risk 5000 bucks. not a problem. <laughs> You own the title, right? I'm a title, yeah. Uh, my company. company. Yeah. yeah. But again, I set it up as a joint venture. So uh, I'm only taxed on my portion of the profit. So a joint venture, we're allocating all the income to all the people involved. You pay tax, you pay tax, you pay your tax, you pay your tax, you pay your tax. Yes, sir, at the back. How am I making money? Because, uh, so again, I'll, I'll keep it quite simple. $2 million we sell, 1.5 is our cost. Say we made 500,000 bucks. We're gonna, I, I create chunks of 100,000 bucks. Okay, so the first 100 is gonna be used to make sure the investors are happy. As we get into the higher chunks, that's where Sean and I make better money. So if we can make 500 grand, Sean and I are gonna look, are, are, are gonna do well. If for whatever reason, the market or his bill doesn't allow us to sell for 2 million, we sell for 1.75, we're gonna make sure, both of us agree, that our investors need to be looked after first. We're not guaranteeing them a return. Okay, there is no guaranteed rate of return for the investors, okay? But we wanna keep them happy, okay? We wanna partner up with people that, you know, will realize, hey, here's the money we made. I got an open book. I provide financial uh, reporting, any questions, here it all is. Uh, so we allocate the profit accordingly. So far, there hasn't been. It's a joke. Maybe those with the five thousand don't get the money back. It's a <laughs> 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 
okay, you know what? I'm going to address that question because you know what? The last thing in the world I want, I'm in the, I've chosen to leave this nice, protected, regulated marketplace. I'm in the unregulated marketplace. The last thing I want in the world is a lawsuit. Okay, so if there is an issue with an investor, we're going to solve it. And if that means less money in my pocket, hey, that's okay. I'm doing okay. Don't worry. Sorry? Sorry? Because if market changes, yeah. right, they yeah. cannot. The they first thing I say to anybody. Not only like uh, profit, they, they can lose their initial investment. Listen, people, we all know, okay, the minute you take money out of a GIC and put it into anything, there is risk. Okay? So what I do is I talk about the risk. I'm not somebody that stands up here and talks about all the great things we can do to make you money. When we're doing business, I spend half of my time talking to the investors about all the things that might go wrong. Okay, because the problem that can happen is if an investor, something happens to an investor that they weren't expecting. There's the problem. If I say to you, if you're an investor, and we'll use the same numbers, you've got whatever invested into the property, I'm going to say to you, we're going to do the best we can, we're going to build this house, but if for whatever reason the market comes crashing down and we can't sell the house for 1.4 million, you're going to lose money. And please sign this document that you know that. Okay, so there is no, there's no guarantees unless, now with those projects too, we might have people who want to lend money. Okay, lending money is cheaper for me than paying investors. So someone might come in, we're just doing one now, where somebody's coming in at 400000 and is doing it as a mortgage for our construction. Right? Awesome. 8%. Cheap, 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 cheap. I think you're 12% and 14% for construction. I think you can, you know, that this is if Sean doesn't finish him in six months, finish him in eight, you, you, you lost Well, out. I mean, uh, Sean, when do we start at Brookside? June? June. Yeah, June, six. June 27, there was a bungalow there. Yeah. And we built a three story, 3,000 square feet, brand new. I'm talking like, Shimon, it's too bad we can show you guys in a virtual tour for the last house we did. And, um, I mean, no, we I'm not questioning that, I'm, I'm questioning there's a high rate. 14% uh, construction financing a little bit. So so more, can, very I comment, fair can I comment can on that? Yeah, 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 can I comment on that? Okay. So, uh, so there's a person actually, we met, we met through Sean. There's a gentleman uh, who, uh, my understanding is he's an experienced uh, lender on construction projects. And the reason that his offer is appealing, and what he's offering is 10% rate plus 4% uh, fee. And uh, interest is only, of course, as in any construction loan, interest is only charged on money that's advanced, number one. Um, and besides that, uh, what he proposes to do, uh, because he himself is also a contractor, he understands what he's looking at, is that he can come in and eyeball the project without the need for formal appraisals and going back through the lawyers and paying more fees to the lawyers and to the appraisal company and waiting for the appraisal to be ready and so on and so forth. So uh, I don't know if you worked this gentleman before, but I had a conversation with him and um, I guess from, from past experience uh, with Jerry and I've seen this with other borrowers as well, that when you're waiting for your construction money on a job, it, it can be a real pain. Uh, dealing through all that process. So that's why for a little bit extra money, yeah, so we thought we would give it a try. And it's Jerry's decision ultimately, but I had a conversation with the guy and it seemed to have some appeal for that, for those reasons. Yeah, and if I can just add to that uh, question or comment, uh, it's important that that construction money flows freely because this guy, when the money is not there, he stops or slows down. Sean, you, you get the, like if the money is there, you're getting deals, you're buying all this stuff well in advance. So I have to keep him and his crew going. And sometimes the construction money, you know, that's why a lot of times with investors, their money is easier to access than a lot of this construction money because that's a process involved. Oh, we have to come and look at the house. Oh, we have to figure out how much it's worth. We have to do an appraisal. So by the time we get the draw that we need, He's going, Jerry, where's the money? Come on, I gotta write a paper, we gotta keep going. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's just management. Um, so, you know, as we do more and more, we find better uh, partners, be it multiple.
mortgage partners, be it construction mortgage partners, be it equity partners. Uh, so, you know, it, it's just managing the, the uh, project. So. What marketplace are you focusing? Sorry? What marketplace you're focusing? So we concentrate basically, so we have three right now. The addresses are, if anybody wants to write them down, go ahead. We're having an open house, right? Simone, this weekend? The open house is this Saturday and Sunday. Okay, so that, that one is at 86 Brookside, which is a Jane and Dundas. Feel free to go over there. You can see the work this guy does. Uh, and by only buy it for two million if you want. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so 86 Brookside is one. Uh, another project we're working on, uh, 11 Lorne Avenue. Okay, that is at uh, Park Lawn and, Queen and Queensway. So uh, that house is standing. We've ripped the whole inside of it out and we're just gonna redo it. You're gonna put a second level up or something. So that's one. Uh, we closed one uh, Tuesday, two days ago, 293 Armadale, which is uh, right at uh, Jane and Bloor. Well, we, it's, it's not so much that we focus there. Uh, we know that market. Uh, and part of my presentation was to say, you know, uh, people can build, they can, can use this platform to build their own business models. So I work with real estate agents and I say to them, go find us a house, but bring investors too. They know that market. So real estate agents know the real estate market. Right? I've always kind of been surprised. The real estate agents are looked at as real estate experts. They buy and sell houses. Hey, what about getting into the investment business? You know, they have the golden opportunity to build a relationship with a seller or a purchaser for two, three, four, five months. Build a good, solid relationship. Why don't you talk to that person about investing, real estate-related investing? So I do work with a lot of agents, uh, and they'll take us somewhere. We haven't gone there yet. Okay, but if a real estate agent up in Markham knows, you know, they know that market, we're gonna bring a property to us. Hey, there's a million dollar property that if you add five hundred thousand uh, dollars, you'll sell it for two million dollars. That agent is not gonna tell me that if the investors they bring in, because that's part of it, if I just stood there and said, Hey agents, call me for houses to sell and you're going to bring up those. You got the agent has to bring the investors. Okay, so then we can put the whole project together. I got the builder, I got the, uh, you know, the ability to put the whole structure together on a joint venture basis. Uh, and not just real estate agents. I work with a lot of accountants. Okay, anybody with a client list can add financial services to their business model. Anybody can, especially the way I've structured my business model because even though I'm not licensed anymore, I access those five marketplaces through referral channels. So if a client, again, a lot of the real estate income trusts are in this private equity uh, marketplace. So I can go in there and get that. Not myself, because I'm not licensed. I work with a full partner, we want a centurion REIT, we want a coolest street. And that's the same with stocks, mutual funds, mortgages, insurance. So I don't have to be licensed in that marketplace to access that marketplace. That's why I don't operate with a license. And that also, again, as I mentioned, allows me to do all these real estate related investment activities. Don't keep going or um, no, so. let's, uh, is there one last question for, of course, Jerry will be around. There's going to be plenty of time for networking. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes uh, briefly, then we'll go around the room, then we'll have some time for networking. Jerry, Jerry's here all night. We have the room until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, so. There's a week <laughs> game on at 10, you know that. There's a game on. Or 9.30. Okay. You've got to get home to watch that. So, uh, and Justin, by the way, uh, Ernest is in the back door. Let me forget to introduce you. Okay, any last question for Jerry, or can we keep it moving? No, we'll keep it moving. Okay, let's keep it moving. No okay, questions. Jerry, nice job.